Hi, I'm Elijah, and today I'm going to be interviewing Matthew Zia, who is a theatre director, and we're going to be talking about his journey with Stratford East and in life in general. Okay, so first we might as well talk about how you first got into theatre. Uh, yeah, I feel like this is a story that I've, I've told many times, so I'm going to try and make it interesting, but you've never heard it, so it might be interesting, it might be interesting. Uh, I used to say I was a naughty kid. Uh, and that, that I discovered drama as a way of kind of having a bit of an outlet. Um, having explored why I was naughty and what was going on, uh, I grew up in a poor household where people were quite busy trying to earn money and out, a single parent household. So I think what I was really chasing was attention uh, and my acting out was a way of getting attention. Uh, but then I found that you could act as opposed to acting out and acting up. Um, and someone, I went to Tom Hood School, which is now called Buxton Academy um, in Leytonstone. And someone there said, oh, you know, there's a, a youth theatre down the road, there's a local theatre. And I feel incredibly privileged that this was the theatre um, that the youth theatre was part of. And so I wandered down. Uh, it was like weekly classes and you just paid your one pound sub. Uh, and there was a, a little porter cabin next door. Um, and that's where it was. And I remember the first time I came, I was even too scared to go in. And I peered through the, through the frosted glass and just saw lots of people moving and I just, I think I was scared and I went home. Uh, and the next week my mum said, you've got to go, go on, go and do it. And uh, I haven't looked back since. How did you get into it? I just really enjoyed acting in general, like I was doing it since like primary school. And it was more so musicals back then. So in, in my primary school every year, the teacher would do a musical, so we were doing Annie. And basically all the people who were doing Annie got to leave class early. And I just, I just had to bug lessons, so I had to like do acting stuff. So when I was doing Annie, I got to skip maths and English and stuff. Yeah. And I realised when I was doing Annie that I actually enjoyed acting. Yeah. And I carried it on through to secondary school when I'd done GCC drama. And then one day my friend just said, oh, listen, you've got to come down to this theatre and do proper classes. Mm -hmm. Then it evolved into me doing performing arts at the Brit School as well. Nice. And yeah. this year I've just carried it on ever since. Yeah, good, good, good. That's it. It's like we just need a a first bite to even know that it's there and an option and a possibility. Um, and when I was 18, the guy who was the artistic director here, Philip Headley, suggested that I join the board of directors. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I said yes. And joined the board of directors and said very little for the first three years, but 10 years later, I was still on the board and I'd, I'd found a voice. Um, and this pirate radio show that I was doing had been picked up by BBC One Extra. So at the age of 18, I had my own show on One Extra which I did for six years, so I had this dual life. And then this guy, again, it's all people who were based here, called Alts, uh, who's a designer, director, he was an associate here as well, uh, said, I've got this idea that we can adapt uh, an old musical called The Boys from Syracuse into a new musical. He said, you know how, uh, speaking of Annie, uh, he said, you know how Jay-Z's just sampled It's a Hard Knock Life? I think we can sample the whole musical and re reinterpret every song as a piece of hip hop or garage or grime or whatever was around at the time. So we did that with the young company um, and it went quite well. And then Philip said, actually, I think we should do that as a professional show. So we took all the seats in here out, turned it into a club, put crash barriers in, had bouncers on the doors um, and did this whole show where everybody was on microphones all rapping out and I was up uh, DJing. Now, uh, if I go back into youth theatre, the woman who was running it at the time called Julia Samuels said to me recently that there was one session where I said, when are we going to do the other stuff? And apparently what I meant by that was writing and directing. I don't remember asking that, but it feels like I must have always had this interest in like the, the bigger architecture of the story as opposed to the playing and the performance of the story. And I guess because I didn't go to, like I dropped out of sixth form, um, didn't go to university. I guess my education was was here um, by watching great artists and leaders and makers and writers. Um, and I always say like, you know, like the reason I feel privileged to have walked into this theatre, because it reflected uh, me and my life and the world I'd come from. Uh, and lots of the people that I saw up on the stage looked like me, sounded like me. So yeah, I felt lucky that the place I wandered into reflected and represented my principles, my values. And they're the things that I've carried on. Uh, and in everything, I, th I feel like what I'm always trying to do is just 
make versions of the theatre that I walked into as a kid. Um, even in every show I'm doing, every company that I'm involved in working out what it should be doing, I'm just going, yeah, how do we make it open, accessible, inviting, welcoming for everybody? Is there any like films or like pieces of theatre that you've seen that have really wanted to get to make you become what you are now? Like have you had like any influences or anything? No, I feel like my influences are people more. And like I say, they're the people that were here. So uh, Joe Melville, Joe Martin, Clint Dyer, the group, you know, like the, I don't want to expose them, but the group who are 10 years older than me, uh, who were around here, but they'd moved into being professionals, uh, felt really exciting. And then the people who were leading this organization and, and associates here, so Philip Headley, Kerry Michael, Dawn Reed, uh, Alts, Clint Dyer, who just kind of said, you can, when I had always been told I couldn't, uh, and I, I believed that I couldn't. And I think that's what it kind of took. And then there were certain shows, there was a, uh, Robbie G and Eddie Nesta and The Posse and Adi Akolai, who were like sketch comedians uh, and did a number of like sketch shows. Just being empowered to go, you can do it, I think is, is all it took. Um, and also the people that, I guess the people that were in youth theatre with me, so like um, Ricky Norwood, uh, who went on to be Fat Boy in EastEnders, and Darren Hart, who was in loads of the pantomimes here and, and on kind of does lots of stuff on, on children's television, and Trish Cook, the writer, and Robert Hyman, who wrote all the music for the panto. So I'd like much more people than, than projects and ideas. How has theatre changed like from when you started to now like even with Stratford East and how theatre's just evolved like how, how has it looked to you has it been like a massive development or is it kind of the same sort of thing? no I think it's a really really slow evolution like the way water can erode a cliff face but over thousands and millions of years so I feel like there is there are changes and shifts happening some places have always been more progressive. I think this is one of them. Um, feels like lots of places have, have been catching up, particularly over the last two years. Uh, people are suddenly going, oh, right. There are other people who like theatre. There are other people who might want to see theatre. There are other stories that we're not telling. And I think that's where my focus is. That, like, who tells the stories? Who's empowered in telling those stories? Whose voices are we amplifying? and how much is that reflected in the audience and the governance and the management and staff of a building. So yeah, I think it's that, isn't it? Um, and if I'm honest, like not enough change has happened. I wanted to ask you about what it's like being like, black in the industry and if there's any sort of things that need to be changed in the industry for black people, like as in for, for like when you're in the room and like, there's just work being done that isn't for you, that you feel like needs to be changed as in black people getting opportunities that are catered to black people instead of black people getting opportunities that are more so not for them. Yeah, oh, that's big, that's huge. Um, I think part of what I'm saying before about when I came in here is there were lots of black people here uh, on the stage, in the audience, in the, in the offices around the building. Um, so it felt really easy to walk into this space. And I think that's the thing, it's about occupying spaces and occupying spaces that have not historically been for us uh, and that we have been excluded from. I think those changes are happening, but, the, but lots of people are doing like the window dressing, uh, you know, changing the, the shop display, not looking at the management, not looking at the governance, not looking at the, the power structures within organizations. That's why I get excited that people like myself, uh, people of colour like Nadia uh, Four, who's the artistic director here, people like Rory Alexander-Wise and uh, Dan Bailey and Kwame Kweamar and Lynette Linton, um, many of those people who, who came through this building as well as, as younger people, uh, are in positions of leadership uh, and getting onto boards and becoming part of governance structures. Uh, and building relationships with the Arts Council. And I think that's where the real shifts will happen. Um, 
I think some places are still getting it wrong and are going to continue to get it wrong because they don't understand the, the problem at a kind of profound level. Um, so gestures will be tokenistic. Uh, there will be that one black face in the company of 12 performers um, because it's the thing that you're meant to do as opposed to it's the thing that you want to do because you understand the need for it in the world. Um, so yeah, it's just, again, it's back to the kind of the, the eroding of the mountain very slowly by water and I'm kind of over that and I think we just need to blast a hole with some dynamite in the side of the mountain now uh, and, and really take up space and understand that we're one, we're not a monolith, you know, we are complex, diverse, even with, within our blackness and our lived black experiences. Um, so that's where I'm hoping to get to. Do you have like a process as, as a director, like, you know how some people are like, they, they work off a certain practitioner and then they use all their methods or have you created your own sort of? Depends what the project is, I think. Uh, I used to have a process and now my process has become just get the play on and make it good uh, by whichever, whichever means necessary. Um, so like, I don't know, like it's all based on time, isn't it? How much time do you have? What do you, where do you need to get to? But the real big thing for me is to get everybody on board the same bus, the same train, so we're all going in the same direction. We can't all be trying to tell 12 different stories. We've got to be a shared objective in the telling of this piece to excite everybody, to get everyone to care so that we, we all kind of handle the thing delicately in the construction of it. And then when working with the actors, it's simple, like, who are you? How much do you need to know about where you've come from, what your background is? Uh, and then what are you trying to do and who are you trying to do it to? And most importantly, what are you trying to get out of the other person that you're trying to do this thing to? And we just work that out and that will inform the blocking, that will inform the staging, that will inform the way a line is said. Um, there are some practitioners, Mike Alfreds is a, a practitioner who I've met here actually a long, long time ago, who, who wrote a book called Different Every Night, Freeing the Actor, which I like this idea that it must be and will be different every night. You can't replicate the same thing. The audience will be different. The energy will be different. Um, and again, that's about units and objectives and actions. What is your action? What are you trying to do to the other person in the scene? Um, so I think that's it. But it always starts very gradually. I I've kind of describe my process as like, we walk from the shallow end of the pool to the deep end of the pool and you don't quite notice when your feet have left the floor and now you're swimming. So that's the plan. Um, and using every bit of the process for what it is there for. So quite often actors, actors get quite anxious about like trying to be dress rehearsal ready before the tech. And I'm like, no, 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 we'll do the tech. And then at the end of the tech, we'll try and put the whole show back together again. And then we'll do another dress. And that's the one where we need to be ready for the dress rehearsal or trying to be ready for preview three and preview one. It's like, no, let's just get an audience in, let's see how they react, how they respond, what we want to shift and change for preview two. And then preview. So just a gradual process, I think. What do you like when working with directors in terms of what helps you the best? Oh, well, I really like directors who just trust their actors a lot and who don't put a lot of pressure on, on like the whole thing and just allow people to just explore and have fun and it's just really nice having a director who's just really compassionate for me and it's also really nice knowing that like just the wisdom that a director has sometimes like it's just crazy like you they just give you some sort of redirection and you're like wow like how did you even think of that and it's just really nice just learning learning from directors all the time yeah and you have you heard the thing about like uh, good acting is reacting I feel like good directing is reacting as well. You're watching the actors and you're reacting to what they're doing. And I think often that wisdom comes from seeing a little glimmer of something an actor does and go, push that, 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 yeah. um, don't sit on that impulse that you had. You wanted to stand up there on that line, didn't you? And I think that's exactly where the, the unit shift is and that's gonna help us understand what's going on. So yeah, I'd like, that's my advice to actors, make choices. You know, make choices in the audition room, make choices in the rehearsal room, knowing that the worst that can happen is a director goes, eh, not, no, not quite like that. Let's try something else, make a new choice. Yeah. What's the, the plan? Like w when you think of yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, what do you want to be doing? Oh, well, I just want to just explore every realm of myself and just find new 
new ways of just exploring theatre and exploring film and TV. I want to go into like every single realm of theatre and acting, and so I, I just want to just have fun basically and just do like tell stories that haven't been told before. And I want to stay away from like cliches. Like my stereotype is like a black man from like a really ghetto area. I just want to do work that you just look at and think, wow, he, he's done that. Like, wow, that's crazy. So yeah, I just want to explore new new realms of theatre and TV and film. And I just want to develop myself as an actor mm -hmm. and get to stages where I I look back at myself and I think, wow, I've came a long way. And are you still at Brit now? No, I've actually left like at 16, so I'm, I'm 21 now. Right, yeah. So, no, I left at 18, what am I talking about? I left at 18. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so since leaving, I've just joined this young company here and I've, I've done um, punk rock. Yeah. And since doing punk rock, it's just lit a fire in me to just do more, because I, I fell in love with it even more. Yeah. And now I'm at the bush right now with the 18 to 25 young company. Yeah. And right now it's just really cool because I get to see more theatre through that and I'm watching a lot of theatre right now and it's just inspired me to just create more work. Yeah, and you're seeing those brilliant leaders that I spoke about yeah. before, Lynette yeah. and Daniel doing their thing. Um, and I think that's it, like that's like, opportunity isn't going to come and knock on your door, isn't it? Like you've got to yeah. put yourself in front of opportunity and I think you're doing that brilliantly by being in, in spaces like here, the bush, uh, and of course Lynette is one of those people who came through here as a, yeah. as a young performer and a young writer. Well, it's been a pleasure interviewing you today, Matthew. No, thank you.